In Jujutsu Kaisen, the movie has a strange place in the timeline in that it takes place before the events of Season 1, but after the beginning of Season 2. As a result, it can be easy to miss how certain moments in the film directly connect into the main anime, which is why today I'll be explaining everything you need to know. Alright, so if you're watching this, you already know that in JJK Season 1, Yuji was sentenced to death, but if we rewind the clock around 10 months, another student was in the exact same position. The name of that student is Yuta Okotsu, and to understand why the higher-ups wanted to kill him, it's worth examining his backstory. At a super young age, Yuta was diagnosed with pneumonia, and while receiving treatment at the hospital, he bumped into a girl called Rika Orimoto. Rika was an orphan whose parents died in mysterious circumstances, and after their first meeting, both her and Okotsu ended up going to the same school. Over time, the two of them became incredibly close, to the point where Rika took her mom's old wedding ring and used it to propose to Yuta. This scene was important because not only did he agree to marry her in the future, but he specifically says that they'll stay together forever. When Rika was then unexpectedly killed in a car crash, her soul morphed into a vengeful cursed spirit that permanently attached itself to Yuta. In this form, Rika followed him everywhere he went, and for the next six years, her spirit would violently attack anyone who she thought might be a threat to him. This is what brings us to the very start of the JJK movie, where in November of 2016, Yuta was being harassed by four bullies at school. In response, Rika crushed the bullies by stuffing all four of them into a single locker, and allegedly they managed to survive, even though the movie showed them looking like this. Anyhow, following this incident, Jujutsu Hai decides that they should probably do something about Yuta, and in total, they send four sorcerers to deal with him. Although the names of the sorcerers weren't revealed, we do know that one of them was the same rank as Todo, and three others were the same rank as Fushiguro. In spite of that, it's confirmed that Rika took them all down, which gives you some idea of just how powerful she is. Fearing what she might do next, the higher-ups organize Yuta's execution in the autumn of 2017, where they plan to kill him so that Rika's curse would vanish. Okotsu agreed to this proposal since he was tired of hurting people, and at one point he even tried to execute himself before Rika stopped it from happening. With very few options left, the higher-ups eventually called in Satoru Gojo, aka the strongest sorcerer alive, and his job was to teach Yuta how to control the curse. After speaking with Gojo, Okotsu then transfers to Jujutsu High, where he joins the existing class of first-year students. At the time, the first years were Maki Zenin, Panda, and Toge Unumaki, who, as you probably noticed, were all second years when we get around to season 1. When Yuta initially joined their group in 2017, the first years immediately felt Rika's presence, since she's stronger than any curse they would have seen in their lives. The thing you need to remember about cursed spirits is that they're made from a substance called cursed energy, and so the more cursed energy a spirit has, the tougher it becomes. In Rika's case, she's described as having endless amounts of cursed energy, making her essentially invincible and definitely more dangerous than any other curse we've seen in the anime. For that reason, Maki had absolutely no respect for Yuta in the beginning, because he acts like a timid weakling even though he has this unbeatable curse protecting him 24-7. Regardless, Gojo thought it was a good idea to send these two on a mission together, and later that day they head to an elementary school. The reason this school is relevant is because two of the kids recently went missing, and Gojo suspects that a curse was responsible. A second ago, I explained how all curses are made from cursed energy, but what I didn't mention is that cursed energy itself is made from negative human emotions. What that means is that in places like hospitals and schools where people feel all kinds of negative emotions, it's normal for people's cursed energy to leak out and form cursed spirits in these locations. It's the job of sorcerers to then exercise those spirits, and in this scene, Maki single-handedly destroys three of them, while a terrified Yuta just watches on. Following that, they enter the school to search for these missing kids, and although there are curses everywhere, none of them try to attack. Maki quickly realizes that it's because the curses are afraid of Yuta, and after checking his student ID, it's revealed that he's classified as a special grade sorcerer, which is the highest ranking that any sorcerer can achieve. In the entire world, only three other special grade sorcerers exist, with Gojo being one of them, so for Yuta to be on that level is a massive deal. In any case, out of nowhere, a giant curse appears, and unlike the other spirits, this one doesn't hesitate to attack the first year students. Both Maki and Okotsu are then swallowed by this thing, and on the inside of its stomach, they find the missing kids who they'd been searching for. At this stage, both children were in a really bad condition thanks to the effects of the curse, and to make things even worse, Maki herself also starts getting affected. This left Yuta as the only person who could save them, which was bad news for everyone since he still had no clue what he was doing. That's why a frustrated Maki gives him a pep talk since their lives are literally depending on it, 
and luckily he thinks of a plan soon afterwards. By putting on the engagement ring that Rika gave him, it strengthens his connection to her cursed spirit, and because of that he was able to ask to borrow her power. Up until now, Rika would just kind of emerge whenever she felt like it, but this occasion was the first time Yuta summoned her to do something for him. She then proceeds to tear apart the other cursed spirit limb from limb, giving Yuta the chance to free himself and carry everyone else to safety. In this scene, Okotsu makes the decision to change as a person, and from this moment onwards he was more determined than ever to break Rika's curse. Once the curse is broken, she'll no longer be stuck in this form, and her soul will finally be free to pass on to the afterlife. However, the challenge here is that because her cursed spirit is basically invincible, you can't just destroy it in the same way you would destroy a regular curse. Instead, what Yuta has to do is unravel her curse step by step, and I'll explain how. The basic concept is that Yuta's ring enables him to borrow small parts of Rika's curse, and so once that's done, he could channel that tiny curse into this katana. With enough practice, the aim is to keep channeling larger and larger amounts of Rika into the sword, until her spirit is fully under his control, and once that happens, the curse will officially be broken. As a side note, following the mission at the elementary school, there are two important things you need to know. Number one, later that same night, a mysterious figure showed up at the school, and based on his shadow, we can tell that this is Suguru Gato. Eleven years earlier, Suguru was a student at Jujutsu High, and was considered to be the strongest sorcerer alongside Gojo himself. Back then, Gato believed that it was their responsibility as the strongest to protect the weakest members of society. However, in 2006, his views began to change after a tragic incident. This incident made him realize that certain people don't deserve to be saved, but as a sorcerer, he has no choice but to defend them anyway. For that reason, Gato eventually started questioning if this job was worth it, since he was putting himself through hell, all to protect humans who he didn't respect. In 2007, he then completed his transition to the dark side, when he massacred an entire village of over 100 people. By this point, he'd abandoned his philosophy of the strong protecting the weak, and instead he now believed that the world would be a better place if only jujitsu sorcerers existed. To make this dream a reality, he spent the next decade gathering an army of followers with the goal of wiping out every regular human on the planet. This is where Rika comes in, because as the most powerful curse, if she was on their side, their mission would suddenly become a lot more realistic. In case you don't know, Gato's curse technique allows him to take control of cursed spirits, and so if he was to kill Yuta, then Rika's immense power would all transfer to him. Consequently, Suguru wanted to test the limit of her potential, hence why he laid this trap for her at the elementary school. The second thing you need to know is that later on when Maki and the kids were recovering in hospital, Yuta came to a realization. Until now, he just assumed that Rika had chosen to curse him, but in reality, he might have been the one who turned her into a curse when he said that they'd be together forever. From Gojo's perspective, this theory was plausible since he never understood how a seemingly normal girl turned into the strongest curse of the modern age. To find out the truth, he immediately opened an investigation into both Rika's background and Yuta's background, as he hoped that this information might reveal clues about where her power comes from. Anyway, flashing forward three months, in that time, Yuta had been consistently training with his katana, and even took part in the 2017 Goodwill event. The Goodwill event is when students from the Tokyo branch of Jujutsu High face off against students from the Kyoto branch, and in Season 1, we found out that Yuta and Rika took part in the 2017 edition. According to the manga, the Tokyo students easily secured the win largely thanks to Rika dominating the event, which is why you might have noticed that in Season 1, Toto was eager to get revenge. Regardless, following the 3 month time skip in the JJK movie, Gojo decides to send Yuta on a mission with Toge Unumaki. Out of all the first years, Toge is by far the most experienced, and his curse technique is known as Curse Speech. To put it simply, it's an ability that makes anything he says happen in real life, with an example being how if he tells someone to stop moving, then that's exactly what's going to happen. As you can imagine, a technique like this could be useful in a million different ways, but the downside is that Toge can't have normal conversations. To avoid hurting people, he only speaks using safe words like salmon, kelp, and other rice ball ingredients, and at this stage in the timeline, Yuta didn't really understand anything he said. The two students then traveled to the mission location, which was an abandoned shopping center full of low-level curses. The job here was for Toge to exercise those curses by himself, while Okotsu's role was mainly to stand there and watch and learn. Before they got started though, Gojo warned Yuta not to let Rika out on this occasion, since the higher-ups didn't really like her unpredictability. If Okotsu was to let her go on another rampage, then it's possible they'd try to execute him even sooner than expected. 
Moving on, after entering the location, the first years encountered the Swarm of Curses, who they were sent here to kill. Within seconds, Inumaki destroys every last one of them by telling them to explode. And just like that, the mission was supposed to be over. However, what they didn't know is that inside of the shopping center, Geto was secretly watching them from a distance. On this occasion, Geto's objective was to see Rika with his own two eyes, and so he ambushes them by using one of his cursed spirits. The plan was for Akotsu to get so overwhelmed by this that he'd have no choice but to summon her again, although this time things played out a lot differently than the elementary school. Towards the beginning of the fight, Toge warned Yuta to stay away since his inexperience made him vulnerable against a curse of this level. The problem though is that Inumaki himself was also vulnerable due to the side effect of his technique. Something you need to know about cursed speech is that when you say powerful words like explode or blast away, there's always a chance that your throat might get damaged. If that happens, the only way to keep using cursed speech is to take throat medicine, but Inumaki's medicine fell out of his pocket right next to the cursed spirit. Because of that, Yuta didn't want his classmate to try and fight this thing alone, which is why they do work together to take it down. Akotsu kicks things off by channeling a tiny part of Rika into his katana and then trying to slash Geto's curse. Even though the slash itself wasn't that deep, it gave Yuta an opening to retrieve the throat medicine and throw it to Inumaki. After recovering his voice, Toge then exercises the curse by crushing it to death, meaning Rika never needed to come out. By the way, I should mention that if Geto really wanted to, he could have just kept releasing more and more curses, but for some reason he chooses to let the first years escape. Hours later, Gojo then hears about the surprise curse that attacked his students, and he goes to take a look around the area for himself. During his inspection, he notices the residuals left behind by Gato, and as a quick note, residuals are just traces of cursed energy that are left behind when someone uses their cursed technique. Because Suguru and Satoru spent so much time together as classmates, Gojo instantly recognized these residuals, and soon afterwards he tells the principal. At the same time, Geto himself was making preparations for a war against Jujutsu High, and if you're wondering how he could possibly win, we need to flash back to 2006. In that year, there was a religious group called the Time Vessel Association, and also several other groups with similar ideas. When Suguru became evil, he took over these groups by force, which gave him access to money, and more importantly, it gave him access to curses. For the next decade, he built up a reputation for healing people who were cursed, as his technique lets him absorb spirits. Thanks to this, in the present day, Geto has accumulated over 6,000 curses, including at least two special grades, not to mention he has an army of followers who I already mentioned. Now, if he was to add Rika to all of this, then Suguru believes he'd have a 99% chance of overthrowing Jujutsu High. Once that's done, he could finally achieve his goal of destroying all non-sorcerers, as in his mind, apparently not even Gojo would be able to stop him. That's why in this scene, Geto confidently arrives at the school and declares war against all of his former friends and teachers. To be specific, he tells them that on December the 24th, 2017, he's going to unleash a thousand cursed spirits in Tokyo and another thousand in Kyoto, with each curse being given orders to massacre. The name of this war is the Night Parade of 100 Demons, and if that sounds familiar, it's because in Season 1, we found out that on this night, Toto played a big role in fighting Geto's army. Before we get into that though, after Suguru made his declaration of war, you'd expect that someone from Jujutsu High would try to stop him right there and then. However, although Gojo wanted to do something, there were two reasons why he couldn't hurt Geto in this specific moment. The first and most obvious reason is that Suguru threatened to kill the first years if Satoru didn't let him leave, but in my opinion, there is a second reason we need to factor in. Personally, I think it's fair to say that Gojo is fast enough to have killed Geto before anything happened to his students, but if he did that, there's a chance that all 6,000 of Suguru's curses might be released. This possibility was first mentioned by Toji Fushiguro, who refused to kill Geto back in 2006, purely because he didn't want to deal with all the cursed spirits that might come pouring out. To me, it's possible, if not likely, that Gojo came to a similar conclusion and therefore allowed his former best friend to fly away. Moving on to December 24th, in both Tokyo and Kyoto, Jisu High had gathered nearly every sorcerer they had. Their mission was to exercise all 2,000 curses heading their way, but noticeably Yuta was left back at school. Due to Rika's unpredictable nature, there was a risk that if she was on the battlefield, she might end up destroying both sides. As a result, it was safer to just leave Okotsu behind, which is exactly what Geto thought was going to happen. All along, the true objective of the Night Parade of 100 Demons was for all the experienced sorcerers to be distracted in Kyoto and Tokyo, while Yuta is left completely alone. 
With that being the case, Geto casually marches into Jujutsu High, where the only one left standing between him and Akatsu is Maki. From Geto's point of view, this is exactly the type of person who he wants to eradicate, and so he quickly wipes her out with the centipede looking cursed spirits. Meanwhile, over in Tokyo, Gojo begins to wonder why Suguru isn't on the front lines, and as he's thinking, he suddenly gets interrupted. I mentioned earlier in the video how Satoru requested an investigation into Yuta's background, and in this scene, he finally gets the results. After hearing this info, it causes him to realize where Geto has to be, and so he teleports Toge and Panda back to Jujutsu High. I should point out that this move from Gojo was extremely calculated, since he knew these two never had a single chance of defeating Geto. Instead, the reason he sent them back is that he assumed they would lose, and he was hoping this would trigger Okotsu to get even stronger. Luckily for Gojo, that's exactly what happened, because when Okotsu found his classmates lying in a bloody mess, he instantly allowed Rika to come out. They both then easily destroyed a swarm of curses that Suguru sent towards them, before taking a quick break to heal the other first year students. The significance of this moment is that it showed Yuta using reverse curse technique, which is a skill that even Gojo struggled to learn at a similar age. Reverse curse technique is when you take negative energy and multiply it with more negative energy to create a positive energy that can heal the body. Overall, it's a complex thing that nearly all sorcerers fail to accomplish, so for Yuta to do it already after a few months, it proves that he is a special talent. Following that, Gato tries to take him down by unleashing another horde of curses, but this time Akotsu counters it by using Cursed Speech. Historically, Cursed Speech is a power that belongs to the Inamaki clan, but without going into spoilers, Yuta was able to replicate it thanks to a combination of Rika's help and his own curse technique, which wasn't specified in the movie itself, and he exercises all these spirits by ordering them to die. Now, back in Tokyo, Gojo is busy fighting against Miguel, who's an African sorcerer and one of Geto's strongest followers. Miguel's job was to stall Satoru for as long as possible so that his boss would have enough time to finish the job of capturing Rika. You might be curious how Miguel was able to survive this long in a battle against Gojo, and the answer is that he has a special weapon known as the Black Rope. The Black Rope has the effect of disrupting or cancelling someone's curse technique, meaning Satoru wasn't able to use Limitless to its full potential. An interesting detail is that although it took decades to make the Black Rope, it quickly burned away during this fight until there was literally none left by the end of the movie. Separately, in a nearby location, Geto's other followers were causing chaos, and these two girls are basically his adopted children. Ten years ago, when Suguru massacred the village, the reason he did that is because he found that some villagers were abusing Mimiko and Nanako. This was the key breaking point where he chose to prioritize the lives of sorcerers over the lives of humans, and they've been raised by him ever since. Speaking of Geto, back at Jujutsu High, he decides to personally fight Yuta himself, and if you've watched Season 2, you'll notice that the curse on his shoulder used to belong to Toji. Back in the day, Toji used this curse to store weapons inside of it, and when Suguru gained control of the curse after Toji's death, he gained nearly every tool that Toji had. One of those tools was a weapon known as Playful Cloud, and with Geto's skill, he successfully used it to hold off Rika and Yuta simultaneously. However, in the end, Okotsu unlocks yet another level of his potential when he hits the villain with Black Flash. As you might know, Black Flash is a power-up that increases the strength of an attack by way more than double, and it requires an unbelievable amount of concentration. According to Toto, Black Flash occurs when a sorcerer makes contact and then adds cursed energy to that contact within 0.000001 seconds. Being that precise is the only way this power can be unlocked, which is why no sorcerer in the world can just use it whenever they want. While we're on the topic of Black Flash, over in Kyoto, Nanami unleashed four Black Flashes in a row against these cursed spirits, and in the process broke the world record. At the same time, Toto was in another part of Kyoto, and he single-handedly destroyed a special grade curse in addition to five grade 1 curses. To do all of that without help is a ridiculous achievement, and it clearly helped his reputation since Fushiguro already knew who Toto was before they even met. Anyway, switching over to Jujutsu High, after recovering from a black flash to the face, Geto realizes that it's time to stop holding back. In order to kill Yuta once and for all, he summons this legendary special grade curse, and based on the context, it's safe to assume that this is the most dangerous curse he has. Following that, Suguru then combines every last one of his remaining curses, creating a black mass of pure cursed energy. This move is known as a maximum technique, which as the name suggests is when a sorcerer taps into the maximum potential of what their technique can achieve. 
In Ghetto's case, the overwhelming strength of 4,000 curses plus a legendary curse spirit, it should be enough to crush anyone, including Yuta at his current level. That being said, it was confirmed in the JJK manga that there is one method for any sorcerer to quickly improve, and it relates to binding vows. A binding vow is a contract where you sacrifice one thing in order to gain something else, and for Jujutsu sorcerers, the quickest way to level up is to offer your life as the sacrifice. Realizing that he doesn't have what it takes to defeat Ghetto's maximum technique, Yuta offers up his life to Rika so that they'll both be dead and then can be together in the afterlife. In exchange, he gains full control of her unlimited cursed energy, which manifests in the form of this purple orb. One second later, he and Gato then try to kill each other, and the resulting explosion is so intense it creates a mushroom cloud of pure cursed energy and leaves this giant crater behind. Ironically though, both sorcerers do end up surviving this deathmatch, although it's fair to say Suguru suffered the most damage. As he limps away from the battle, he remarks that Rika's power can change the world, and that next time he'll add her to his collection. However, before he can get away, Satoru finally shows up at the school, and you can tell from Geto's expression here that he quickly accepts he's about to die. During their final conversation, we learn that all of Suguru's followers managed to escape without being captured, while Gojo confirms that he knew Togi and Panda would lose to Geto, but he still trusted that his old friend wouldn't kill them. When we look at this scene in the context of how close they used to be, it is sad how their lives went in such drastically different directions, considering that when they were in school, Suguru always used to be the righteous one who cared about protecting humanity. For him to now be the one in a position like this isn't something that I don't think either of them would have predicted, but at the very least, it is meaningful that Gojo is his executioner, instead of it being Yuta who he barely knows. Just before Satoru finishes him off, he says something that we as an audience don't hear, but based on the clues that we've gotten from the author, it's likely that he said that Getu is still his one and only friend. Following that, Suguru gets executed by Gojo's limitless curse technique, while in a different part of the school, an unconscious Yuta wakes up. Because of the contract that he made with Rika, Akotsu was fully expecting to die in this moment, but in a surprising turn of events that doesn't end up happening. Instead, Rika's spirit abruptly turns back into her human self for the first time since she died, and Gojo arrives just in time to explain why. Three months ago, when they first opened the investigation into Yuta's past, Jujutsu Hai had to dig really deep to find out the truth. What they eventually discovered is that Akotsu is the descendant of Michizane Sugawara, who was a legendary Jujutsu sorcerer from a thousand years ago. If you want to know more about Michizane, then I'd highly recommend watching my other video where I explain his backstory and his connection to the Gojo clan, but for now, the main point is that he was insanely powerful. That's why in the present day, Yuta has more cursed energy than any other living human, even more than Gojo, but because his family aren't sorcerers, he was never taught how to control it. Therefore, when Rika was hit by a car, Akotsu refused to accept her death, and since he was untrained, his curse energy awakened and flowed out of him, transforming her into this monster. To put it another way, all the unlimited curse energy that Rika has originally belonged to Yuta, but it passed to her when he accidentally made her into a curse. However, now that he's accepted her death and gained full control of her curse energy, which is what he was trying to accomplish from the beginning, Okotsu has done everything he needed to unravel the curse. This is why Rika transforms back to normal, and naturally, Yuta felt incredibly guilty for causing all of this trouble. Thankfully, Rika didn't really care, in fact, it sounded like she enjoyed her time as a cursed spirit, and as she passes on to the afterlife, she warns Okotsu not to join her anytime soon, implying that Rika wants him to have a long life, even if it means that they're not together. After this incident, Yuta stays on as a student at Jujutsu High, while the topic of him being executed is never mentioned again. You might then be wondering, why don't we see him during Season 1, given that all of his classmates were at the 2018 Goodwill event? The answer to that can be found during the movie's post credit scene, where Yuta is seen chilling with Miguel in a foreign country. According to the fanbook, after Geto's followers escaped, Gojo went out of his way to track down Miguel and forced him to train Yuta. Miguel wasn't really in a position to say no, but despite that, he gets along well with Okotsu, despite everything that happened with Geto. Without going into spoilers, there is one other reason why Gojo wanted Yuta to spend time with Miguel, and it's why they went on this trip to Africa in 2018. In fact, in the opening credits for season 1, we even got this brief shot of them walking together, as it was the anime's way of hinting what Okotsu was up to while everyone else was at school. 
With all that said, that was the whole of the JJK movie explained in around 25 minutes or less. And if you enjoyed this video, then I'd appreciate if you hit that sub button so you don't miss out on future content like this. Also, don't forget to hit that like button as it does help out with the algorithm and everything else. And until the next one, peace out.